Open your Bibles to the last, next to the last book in the Bible, the book of Jude. Jude's a short book, only has 25 verses in it, but a very interesting book, relevant to our day and time. Last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. There is no other book in the Bible that describes the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ like the book of Revelation. It describes to us what's going to take place during his coming, what's going to take place after his coming, and what's going to take place when he comes back in the second coming of his revelation. It also tells us about the heavenly home of the child of God. That's how the book of Revelation closes out. But it's very interesting where God puts the little book of Jude. In in chronology order, he places it right before the book of Revelation. Just the 25 verses, but it reads like today's newspaper. It reads like the things that are happening all around us. Jude is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me explain that. Jesus' father was God the Father, born of a virgin. Now after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph got married had other brothers or had other children, sons and daughters. And of those sons, Jude was one of them. So that makes him having the same mother as Jesus, but not the same father as Jesus. You follow me? Jesus is the only person that's ever been born that was virgin born. Now you can't be saved without believing that. You say, well, preacher, I don't understand it. There's a whole lot of things I don't understand, but yet I believe them. And that's one of them. So Jude is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. I do not think Jude or his brothers or his sisters really believed that Jesus was the Son of God when they were growing up. As a matter of fact, there are verses in the Bible that tell us that the family of the Lord Jesus Christ even denied publicly that he was God's son. But after the resurrection of Jesus, things changed. And especially in the life of Jude. God used Jude to write one of the Greatest books in the Bible. You don't hear many people preach from it. You don't hear many people talk about it. But Jude is one of the greatest books in the Bible or it wouldn't be there. So God uses Jude to place this book right before the book that tells us about the coming of Christ, things past, things present, and things future. So I want us to look at it today The book of Jude is primarily divided into four parts. And uh, we want to look at those four parts as time will allow us to do so, not be able to cover all of them, but be able to cover most of them. In verses 1 through 3, Jude tells us, first of all, who he's writing this book to. That's found in verse 1. He's written to those that are sanctified by God the Father. They are preserved in Christ Jesus and they are called. So he's writing to God's people. He's writing to the Christian to let us know that there are some things that we ought to open our eyes to and some things that we ought to be well aware of. They're happening, not going to happen. They're happening all around us right now. The book of Jude is being being, uh, fulfilled while you sit there in this seat and while you go about your everyday life, 
the book of Jude is being literally fulfilled. Now in verse 3, he starts off real strong. And the book of Jude is a strong book. It does not pull any punches. Jude does not beat around the bush. He comes right to the point and tells it like it is. I like Jude because of that. In this days that we are living in, we certainly don't need anybody beating around the bush. We need somebody that will open our eyes and open our heart to all of that's going on this day and time. You say, well, preacher, I keep up with the news. It's possible to keep up with the news and still not be bothered with what's going on. That's where we're at this day and time. I want to speak to you today as best I can on the last days. That's where we're at, folks. I believe with all of my heart that we're in the last days. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean by that? I mean that the Lord is about to wind this thing up and Jesus is coming back to get his children and Jesus is coming back to get his church and all hell is going to break loose on those that are left. That's what I mean. And it's not a fairy tale. It is going to be real. And Jude tells us about that in verse 3. He tells us that I wanted to write to us of the common salvation. But he said another need has risen and I want to talk to you earnestly about contending for the faith. Now that word contending is is an interesting word. It means to fight for. It means to wrestle for. It means to do everything you can to keep the faith. Now, why in the world would Jude, in his rather opening marks, talk to us about contending for the faith? It is simply because we're living in a day and time of quitters. We're living in a day and time when folks are turning their back on the Bible and on God. We're living in a day and time when folks are turning their back on the church. It's speaking about those who have made professions of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but something has happened in their life that's caused them to turn aside and to quit. My Bible tells me that one of the signs of the last days is that there will be a great falling away. And those of you that know anything about the church, we're living in that day and time. I have never in my life seen anything like we're having today. I travel across this country. I have the privilege of preaching in a lot of churches, preaching to a lot of folks that come together in, in Bible conferences and camp meetings and things like that when a lot of other churches join in. And I hear this same thing from pastors all across the country that folks are falling out and they're quitting and they're just giving up. I don't understand it. Folks seem to get the idea that when they quit church, church is all they quit. No, you quit God when you quit church. And you quit God when you're not living like you ought to live. And when you give up and throw in the towel, you are guilty of being a quitter. I see folks this day and time at sports events all across this country. Now, I've told you this a thousand times. I love NASCAR. Well, I don't love NASCAR. I love my wife. She sometimes wonders if I do when NASCAR comes on. But I I like to watch it. I I mean, I really do. I'm, I'm hooked on NASCAR. I watch it for one purpose. To watch Rowdy hit the wall. But he ain't been doing... Well, I'm sorry. If you pull in for him, you pull in for the wrong one. But anyway... 
He hadn't done that lately. He'd been winning left and right. And, uh, but I, I like to watch it. I seen yesterday, not the big race, next to the big race, 50,000 fans fill that stadium to watch 43 cars turn left all day long. Go around in a circle. That's all they done. 50,000 people. Now look around you this, in this auditorium today and look at the empty seats. If there's any place in the world that ought to be filled to capacity on Sunday, it's God's house with folks worshiping God. But the reason we're not having it is folks are quitting on God. Now I know folks change churches and there may be legitimate reasons for that. It may be because of the leadership in the church. It might be because the doctrine is wrong. And it might be because conflicts have come up with others and people move on. I realize that and I know that. But the majority of folks that quit church are just out there and never try to find another church, never worship God anymore, just lay everything in their spiritual life aside. Jude says, I want to warn you that in these last days, it's going to be tough. and You need to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. I don't know about you, but when I started out in the Christian life, church became an important part of my life. I mean, it did. Other than my home life, church was next. Right? I grew up that way. When uh, I, I went to church almost every night of the week when I was growing up. And we didn't complain. We knew better. My dad had a black belt. That, not in karate, but a black belt. And we never grumbled and we never griped about going to church. When Sunday come, there was nothing else planned. It was church, honey. I've heard people say, well, the reason I don't go, I was made to go when I was young. Honey, that don't hold water. Look at me, that don't hold water. I went through it as much as anybody ever had gone through it, and I still love church. Why? Because I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do everything I can to fight to love the Lord and live for the Lord and make church an important part of my life. Amen. Parents today are more interested in their kids learning dance lessons than they are learning the Bible. Amen. More interested in having them to excel in sports than they are to excel in Bible knowledge. Right. We'll yell our lungs out at a ball game and I do the same thing. Nothing wrong with that. Then we sit in church like knots on a log and can't even smile. And we just dare God to bless us. Why? It's because we haven't come to the place to where he's more important than everything else in our life. He ought to be number one. I want to finish well. I started out good and I want to finish the same way. I don't want to be a dropout. I don't want to be a quitter. I want to stay right in there for the Lord Jesus Christ. I may not be the best Christian, but I cannot be a quitter, my friend, because of what Jesus did for me. He didn't quit on me and I don't want to quit on him. So Jude writes, about contending for the faith, verses one through three. And then verses four through 10, he gets real blunt. He tells us about not only contending for the faith in verses one through three, but in verses four through 10, the corruption of the flesh. Now I want to be as polite as I can, but I want to be truthful to you Hopefully open your eyes. In verse 7, he tells us about strange flesh. 
and people going after strange flesh. That's where we're at this day and time. Without spelling it out, I think you clearly understand that. In verse 8, he calls them filthy dreamers. See what it says? Likewise also these filthy dreamers. That's the ones that go after strange flesh. And those filthy filthy dreamers defile the flesh. In verse 10, he calls that crowd brute beast. Things that are going on in our country this day and time, beast. That's animals now. Beast, animals, don't even do to each other. Say amen right there. Natural things, not natural things are going on between men and women this day and time. And you know what? We've gotten to the place in this country of ours that we call them heroes. You've heard that word lately. Now don't draw up on me. I'm just telling you the truth and you know it's the truth. And Jude saw this coming thousands of years ago and he wrote about it. He said there will be a time coming when the flesh of mankind will be corrupted. Yeah, we're there. Ain't no doubt about we'll be in there. I'm going to move on in just a moment. But I'm telling you it's a disgrace to America and it's a disgrace to God and it's a disgrace to this Bible what's going on between people in this old world of ours. Hmm. All you got to do is turn your television on watch the news. There is a program that comes on Channel 4. We watch Channel 4 because our son-in-law is reporter on there and he's also the anchor on Saturday but there's a program that comes on every night after the evening news I'm trying to think of the name of it we don't watch it we just when it comes on we switch off to something else it's called ET is ET entertainment tonight is ET I'm not telling you you ought to watch a little bit of that, but if you do, it ought to startle you as a Christian. We switch it off and watch something else. I don't care who got rid of one husband today and got another tomorrow and planning on having another one the next day. That don't interest me. I tell you what does interest me to hear somebody on the news say these people have been married 60 years. That blesses my heart. But you're not hearing much of that anymore because of the strange flesh that's in this old world today and how flesh is being corrupted. God views the Christian flesh as his temple. He used to live in this body of ours, the flesh. And Paul says that we ought to bring it under subjection. And the only way you can do that is to be a Christian and live for the Lord. But Jude says before Jesus comes, all of this stuff's going to take place. Then in verses 11 through 21, He tells us about false religions and so-called churches that are going to arise in the last days. Verse 12, he says, These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees, whose fruits withered, without fruit, twice dead, 
plucked up by the roots. False religion. Verse 13 tells us that God has reserved false religion in the blackness of darkness forever. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Can I tell you that when God leaves a church, when that church no longer preaches the truth, it ceases to be a church. Listen to what I'm saying. Jude said there'll come a time when they'll not preach anything about the blood. They'll not preach against any sin. They'll just preach to please the congregation and to get the crowd. That's what's going on. He said in verse 12, things like that will be plucked up by the roots. Now listen. I live on a little old five-acre plot of ground. We got a lot of trees. As a matter of fact, I got rid of three of them yesterday. My gout got to feel a little bit better, so I decided to put the bucket on the tractor and push them things over. One was dead. The other's just in the way. So I pushed them over. I've learned down through the years that trees can come back if you don't get rid of the roots. Am I right? So you got to not only push the tree over, you got to get rid of the roots. And if the roots are gone, no more tree. The same thing is true about a church. God said the time is coming when these people that don't preach the truth and they're in it for money and they're in it for popularity will be plucked up by the roots. But he don't stop there. Verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of the advantage. I thought it interesting that he used the word swelling words. On a recent trip, to Sparta, North Carolina, where my uncle's funeral was taking place. I got the other side of Marion, North Carolina, on a two-lane road. Right, but If you ever go up that way, it's right before you get to cross nowhere. On a Saturday morning, fairly early, 9 o'clock maybe, I was going down this long, straight stretch of road, and vehicles behind me kind of pressing me. I was going the speed limit, believe it or not. Guardrail on the right, and before I could blink my eye, a little deer jumped that rail right in the path of my truck. Did you hit it, preacher? I sure did at 55 mile an hour. Rolled that deer under my truck. Car behind me following too close. Hit that deer too. Well, I pulled over to the side of the road to find out if it had done any damage under the truck, you know, or bit my fender or whatever. No damage. I got back in the truck and left. You left that deer laying in the road? What was left of it, I did. Car behind me hit it last. Let them pull it out of the road. (laughs) So I went on. I went on to the funeral. Hot that day. Came back through. This is honest truth. It's not not pretty, but it's honest truth. That deer was twice the size of when I hit it. It was a small deer when I hit it, but it had swelled up. Swelling is caused by rottening from the inside out. The heat 
and uh, the force of the impact had crushed that deer on the inside to where laying there in the hot sun, it rotted and it swelled. I'm sure the next day, unless somebody got it, it was bigger than it was the last time I saw it. That's the way Jude describes some of these movements that's going on this day and time. They don't preach about sin, but they can get a great crowd. They can brag about many, many coming to join their movement. But many of them are swelling from the inside. And they're rotten because they don't preach the word. Hmm. You see, Jude was right on when he was talking about things like that taking place right before the second coming of Christ. And then he closes, and I'm about to close too, verse 22 through verse 25. In light of everything that's going on this day and time, how, what are you and I to do? How are we to live? What are we to say? Above everything else that takes place and things that we don't like and things that Jude warns us about, don't ever forget to have compassion on those that are not saved. I'll be the first to admit I get aggravated at some things going on But my duty as a Christian is to pray for those that are involved in those things that are going on. I feel sorry for this old world that does not know Christ. That lives just for the pleasure they can get out of this life. They live just for the money out of this. I feel sorry for them and we ought to pray for them. The Bible says that of some having compassion in verse 22 and that will make the difference. All of them are not going to get saved, that's true. But verse 23 says some of them will be able to pull out of the fire which talking about hell fire and some of them will be saved. And some of them will go to heaven. But I'm glad he gives us verse 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his of him with glory and exceeding joy. There's coming a great day for those that'll hang on and for those that'll work hard and for those that'll live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me for just a moment. If I can live for Jesus, and I fall short, but if I can live for Jesus, you can too. You can too. What are you going to do when Jesus comes again? Not be time to make things ready. You better make them ready ahead of time. And God's placed you If you're not ready, God's placed you here in this church this morning to give you an opportunity to get ready. Folks, I've studied this Bible now, preached it for 50 years. I honestly, sincerely believe this, and I'm not trying to scare you. I believe we're much, much closer to the Lord coming now than we have ever been in the history of Christianity. He can't let this mess go on much longer. I'm glad I'm ready. I hope you are too. Let's stand with our heads bowed across the building.